Welcome to Wealthion. I'm your host, Eric Chemi. Today, we are focused on what happened to the markets this week. What is going on? We started the year with a bang, and now it's starting to feel a little bit shaky. Saw a lot of earnings coming out, a lot of big names, big stories coming out of Davos this week. So we're joined by Peter Bookvar. He's the author of The Book Report. And Peter, thanks for coming on with me, uh, jumping on today. I know it's it's not been that long since you were on last time. Is there anything keeping you up? Anything got you really worried since we last spoke? Well, it's hard not to be worried about the geopolitics. Uh, on one hand, geopolitical worries really never lead to anything of, of economic significance, and its impact on markets are usually fleeting. I think this time around, we're actually beginning to see uh, some economic impacts, and that is really right now manifesting itself, particularly in transportation costs, which have jumped substantially since the beginning of the year. Uh, and running about double where they were pre-COVID. They're certainly well below the COVID peak, uh, but it's still notable, uh, especially when people are sort of getting comfortable with this declining rate of inflation, and that maybe this is the, the start of a liftoff again, at least on the good side. Uh, then with respect to oil prices, which sometimes yes, sometimes no, are sensitive to geopolitics, it, they haven't yet been. Uh, which is good that there hasn't been any supply disruptions. But in terms of keeping me up at night, you just never know what you're going to wake up to, uh, especially if Iran and Israel get deeper into this. There's oil supply disruptions that can lead to a notable rise in prices. That's something to worry about. And then the other thing is, is not necessarily something that's going to be an event, but we are in a higher interest rate environment. And yes, the Fed might raise interest rates this year, but that doesn't mean that rates fall across the curve. In fact, we're seeing lower short-term interest rates, but higher long-term interest rates. And in a, uh, a very uh, indebted world, you always have to wonder who's going to get tripped up by a higher cost of capital, especially if you have debt coming due this year and you need to refinance and the, loan, the rates on offer are much higher than the rate on the loan you have maturing. So those are the things that uh, I have my uh, eyes out for. And um, it, it's something that everyone should do as an investor. You got to always watch your back. And uh, it seems that um, while there are definitely some positive with the resiliency of the economy, moderating inflation, there's still a lot of risks out there. So just that. It's just that, right? <laughs> it feels, it it, feels like a lot. Worried about a lot of things. There. There's a lot to be worried about. Is there anything that's 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 got you happy though. Is there anything that allows you to sleep easily at night thinking, okay, I I feel good about this, I understand this. Is there any is there anything on the positive side for you? There is, but I, I do I do want to say that that I, I find the the macro landscape right now extraordinarily confusing with a lot of potential big time trade offs, and that one positive road we can go down is going to be offset by something else. Uh, like I mentioned before, the Fed is likely going to cut interest rates this year because of moderating inflation. But maybe in turn, long-term interest rates, which have recently risen over the past couple of weeks, continue to rise. One of the trade-offs. Uh, the bond market right now is pricing in six rate cuts. The Fed is verbalizing through their words in the dot plot only three. Well, if it's only three, maybe that means because the economy is resilient but the bond market then needs to reprice on the short end. If they cut six times, maybe the economy is not so resilient and the unemployment rate is going to four and a half to 5%. Uh, with respect to the consumer, inflation slowing down is a good thing, but inflation, uh, consumers live their life on levels, not the rate of change. They don't go to the supermarket and saying, okay, right. it's still going up. Three. It's, it's prices uh, are going it's, up no matter what the inflation rate is, right? I've never seen a negative inflation rate except for some weird, you know, COVID freak outs or in some other countries. But the inflation number is positive, which means prices are keep going up. They're never coming back down. We're never, we're never going to get those pre-COVID prices ever again. Those are gone. Correct. And that's why inflation is never transitory. The debate really is rate of change on the increase of, of inflation not whether it's going to go up or go down. The key for this year, though, is can wages still stay pretty good, which so far they are. They're running 4 to 
with inflation moderating. So there is some reason for consumers to feel better, not necessarily feel good, but feel better that their wage increases are beginning to uh, mitigate the rise in inflation. On the other hand, and get, getting to the trade-offs, is we're seeing a notable slowdown in the pace of hirings. And just over the past couple of weeks, it seems like we wake up every day and there's another announcement of firings. Today, Wayfair, uh, Macy's yesterday laying off people. Um, Google, Amazon recently announcing layoffs. So there's a lot of cross currents here that it's making the analysis here pretty confusing. And uh, I, I, I would feel more comfortable with markets if they were more reasonably priced. And that ties into all of this too. What does reasonably also, price mean to you though? What, what well, number you look you at the S&P 500, which we know is still dominated by the big tech names, trading at 20, 21 times earnings this year. Uh, that is really rich. I, I know some people like to compare the PE ratio today versus the last 10 years, 15 years, but the last 10, 15 years, we had zero and negative rates. To me, that's not really a good comparison. So I think the market, when I say the market, the S&P is overvalued. There are other parts of the market that are much cheaper, but they're really lagging. So there's no real valuation safety valve to a lot of these risks if they um, sort of manifest itself. Uh, there, there really is a, a smooth sailing belief in valuations that, okay, inflation is moderating, Fed's going to cut rates, soft landing, everything's going to be fine. And, and I, I just don't think it's going to be that easy. So what do you tell people to do right now then? Right? We're looking at all-time highs, but the sentiment that you've had, you could have been saying 12 months ago, right? And, and all of a sudden markets are moving against you. Or they're moving against the person who's being defensive. They're, they are flying in the face of reasonable valuations, right? And people start to panic, start jumping back in, they're jumping back in at the all-time highs, right? And then, I, so I see why you're confused, right? Because I'm confused too. So what do you tell people, what are they supposed to do when sitting on cash, it doesn't, doesn't feel, feel like a great thing when you're looking at everyone else making money and you're not? So uh, as a, a wealth management firm, we're still long the market. So we are still trying to participate with what's going on, but when you're managing other people's money, you're still in the risk management business. And I still take the attitude that I constantly have to wake up and pay attention to the risks. And I mentioned earlier, watching your back, because if I can do that, then I can feel more comfortable, maybe the upside taking care of itself. So with respect to trying to maneuver the level of cautiousness, but still wanting to participate, it's not an easy thing. But what we try to do is, is create some sort of shock absorbers in portfolios, some cushions just in case the negative side plays out. So it's, yeah, okay, being long the, 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 the large cap tech stocks, but maybe owning some gold, owning some energy stocks in case oil prices jump. Uh, still owning, which I still very much like, treasury inflation protected securities if inflation does reverse and head higher relative to conventional. So it's still being long, but trying to add some defensiveness to the portfolio. And, and yeah, maybe we're not going to um, capture every decimal point of upside, uh, but I think we'll, it'll do us well uh, in, in defending the downside. Like I do think we're, we're in a potential environment where the markets just chop around for years as we sort of, sort of have some payback of the extraordinary gains we saw coming out of the great financial crisis and seemingly annual double digit returns that may have stolen from some future returns, especially with the high valuations that we just talked about. Let's focus a little bit drilling in on, on this week's moves. So here we are at the end of the week. What, what stood out to you? I, I think just the, this love affair with technology stocks just won't go away. And, um, and, and just some real mixed signals underneath that with the economy. Like you had a good retail sales number but you had really crappy manufacturing surveys from uh, New York and uh, Philly. Uh, you had very low jobless claims numbers, but every day you're hearing stories about uh, layoffs, uh, adding to just sort of the general confusion. We had earnings season that is really getting into gear. 
We had the big banks last week. We had a bunch more regional banks this week. And I think the overall theme is that loan growth is very muted. Uh, we're seeing, if you look at Discovery uh, credit card, a rise in delinquencies. So it definitely raises uh, the antenna with respect to the consumer. Then the higher end consumer, you have Richemont that had a pretty good number, but then watches of Switzerland stock was down 35% on Thursday, selling Rolexes and, and all different type of watches because uh, concerns about the consumer. So it, it makes your head spin in trying to figure things out. Uh, now, we'll, we'll certainly get a lot more granular information on, on the micro level, which will help us with the macro with more earnings over the next couple of weeks. But um, there, there is no clean level of visibility here at all uh, with respect to the broader economy. I mean, if we, let's say, narrow in on, on certain things, if you look at you know bonds, for example, I'm still looking at this 10 year right around that four, call it 4.15, right? 4.1617. It's, it's the 10 year, right? We saw that 5%. We got all the way down under four, you know, battling back up here. Uh, and what do you make of that, right? Because as these, we're in this environment now where these rates go up, stocks tend to go down here, but, you know, not, not Friday, for example, right? So how do you look at this? I, I think the 10 year is, is behaving. Very interestingly here, uh, when you look at last July, the end of July, when the 10 year started its trip from about three and three quarters in terms of yield up to 5%, it was it started within days when the Bank of Japan announced that they were widening yield curve control, essentially almost ending it in a way. And here we are, we're, we, we come back down again, but we're still at 415, we're still about 40, 40 basis points above that July level. But since last July, inflation rates have slowed. We've priced in many rate cuts. We've not only priced in rate cuts here, but expectations for rate cuts in Europe, uh, possibly the end of, of, of QT uh, in the US. But even with those potential benefits, the 10-year yield is still above. Now, remember, it wasn't too long ago, at the end of last year, uh, or last fall, that we were talking seemingly every day on worries about excessive treasury supply, that U.S. debts and deficits are getting so large that the supply from treasury is going to overwhelm us, and that helped to explain the trip uh, to the to five percent in in uh, the ten year yield. Now all of a sudden, no one's talking about that, but I do think that's still an underlying influence on why yields have ticked up here, uh, particularly as 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 the year got on, and that we're all of a sudden at four fifteen again. A far cry from three and three quarters, three eighty. Again, even with uh, the changes in the market and Fed expectations since last summer. Do you think the Fed really has their handle on what's going on? Like, if you were at the Fed, would you be doing what they're doing, or would you be doing something radically different? So, well, today, uh, well, I, I certainly would have changed, diff, done different things over the last couple of years of, of the period of time going into inflation and how they manage it. But I, I think t that today, just as you and I are talking about a level of confusion with how things are playing out, I think the Fed is dealing with the same thing, is on one hand, they're seeing the moderation of inflation, but they're still seeing a 3% unemployment rate. Uh, they are still trying to figure out where should the level of Fed funds rate measure out at some point relative to this change in inflation. In other words, what's the proper real rate that, that they should point to. Then they're also thinking, you know, well, we're having success on the downside of inflation here after the spike, but we don't want to repeat the experience of the 1970s where inflation flared up, it came back down again, we got complacent, it, 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 it spiked again, uh, we tightened policy, it came back down, we got complacent, and then went into double digits into 1980, 1981. So I, I think there's a high level of play it by ear sort of mentality when it, with, with respect to the Fed. And that's why I do not think they're going to raise, in, I'm sorry, cut in March, because there's still more information to be had. I think the main meeting will be the big debate on whether they do so, but gets again to the question of, of what are they trying to do? Are they going to cut rates because they're trying to get cute with, okay, inflation's down, we don't want to be so tight, let's trim here? Or is there something more macro 
ominous where the unemployment rate is going to inflect higher this year, uh, the consumer is going to roll over and we're going to go into recession because Europe is, is at best not growing. If we're, we take a step back and look at the economy globally, China's seeing some very challenged growth. But on the other hand, Japan's showing signs of life and Southeast Asia showing signs of life and, and Brazil is, is doing okay. So um, I think that the Fed is just going to be, and they've used this word, I'm going to take it from them, careful uh, about how they conduct monetary policy from here. And I want to emphasize one thing with their attitude towards inflation. They are not celebrating because inflation goes up and it comes back down again. The celebration with the Fed begins is if inflation stays down. Like I see a lot of people spiking the football here on this drop down in inflation, which, yes, it's nice. But does it stay down? Right. So, so it can bounce back up. I see your point in that. That's what we had in the past is, is you, you think it's down. You think it's dead and it comes back to life, right? You know, it's like we, we, what are they? It's like when they bury people, but they're not dead yet, right? It's sort of like, are we doing that with inflation? And he's pounding on the casket, get me out of here. I'm, I'm storming back. Exactly. And the, and the Fed, some Fed members in speeches have used some specific words telling the market what they're looking for sustainable. They want to see a sustainable decline in inflation. And Raphael Bostic, the Atlanta Fed uh, president, who does vote this year, earlier this week used two other words. Does inflation fall surely and firmly? So th it needs to stay here. And, and there, there are some arguments to be had that services inflation will continue to moderate this year, but maybe goods prices, which are actually on a year-over-year -year basis back to its pre-COVID trend of basically zero, well, they've spiked, they came back down, maybe they jump again. Maybe this rise in transportation costs clogs up supply chains, as everyone remembered via COVID, and we get a lift in, in prices. Uh, we're not out of the woods here when it comes to this inflation story. And getting back to services, 2024 and into 2025 is going to see a notable moderation further in rental prices, rents being the biggest uh, component of CPI. But, and that's because of all the construction that is going to be finishing up this year of projects that were greenlit when money was easy in 2020, 2021. Well, now right, so there's big lags with that. You get a lot exactly. of big lags. And the that. next lag is by 2025, when these projects get done, there's going to be almost no new building going on because no one's greenlighting projects today. So by 2026 or late 2025, and rents are going to spike right back up again. Speaking of rents, what do you think about that data point we saw Friday morning? Home sales falling to its lowest level in 28 years in 2023. At high mortgage rates, high prices, people are stuck. Right. People are stuck. And, and we have to keep in mind that it's not just, okay, when you transact a home, an existing home that does not take place, that means that, that people are not, when someone moves in, they're not changing the carpet. They're not changing the floors, not repainting the walls. They're not doing a lot of things that people do when they move into a new home. Now, other people can say, well, the existing homeowner, they're going to stay. Maybe they'll sink money into their home. But they did that in 2020, 2021. Everyone did the new kitchen. They put in the new deck. They put in a pool. They did, they did all that stuff to their houses. So that, that stuff is already done. And if they're staying there, there's no reason for them to do it again. So there is a ripple effect to by having this reduced level of transactions. Now, the hope is, is that mortgage rates have fallen and maybe that can restart some transactions. But yeah, home, uh, mortgage rates have fallen, but they went from seven last summer to eight and all, they're, all they are is back to seven. And if the 10 year yield continues to tick up here, mortgage rates are going to inflect higher again. So um, and, and it's and that, that gets to another level of confusion is that new home builds are doing okay because we need more supply. So this housing market, again, is, is sort of upside down uh, with respect to very high prices, still high mortgage rates, but the high mortgage rates are not leading to lower prices, which would help to stimulate demand. We have this high mortgage rate, high price thing that uh, is making it very difficult for first-time home buyers. But then at the same time, right, because we're hearing these, these difficult stories, but then we get that Michigan Consumer Sentiment Survey that came out Friday morning, yeah, Friday morning, right? Yeah, that was the showing 78.8 in January, its highest level since July of 21, 
up 21% from a year ago, following a big jump in December. Despite all this, right? People say, I'm not, I'm not sure about the, uh, the nation's direction. I'm not sure about all of this. And on a two-month basis, sentiment showed its largest increase in two months since 1991, right? A lot of people weren't even alive in 1991, right? That's like 33 years ago, right? If you were born in 1991, you're too old to play pro sports. That is a long time ago. What's going on here? How does this work? So it's definitely the, the moderation in inflation that has gotten people more confident. I think that that is, that is the main story here. Uh, also, income growth expectations rose and, and the employment number did. But certainly the slowdown in the rate of inflation has gotten people more comfortable. And, and, and you can definitely uh, attribute most of the improvement in confidence due to that. Now, there were some caveats within the commentary in the confidence number and that, and as we so, spoke about earlier, consumers are still struggling with the high level of prices, uh, even though the rate of change has slowed. So they're, they're, it's not all um, a bed of roses here uh, and consumers so sanguine, but it is a rate of change improvement uh, no question, at least right now. Uh, the question, though, is, is whether that translates into a pickup in spending. And that really remains to be seen because some of the retail commentary we got from some of the retailers I mentioned are somewhat soft, but then you had retail sales that were good. And, and tying through that, you have buy now, pay later, which is helping to lift retail spending. You have in November saw the biggest one month increase in credit card usage since early 2022. So are consumers stretching again to, to make things work? Uh, is buy now, pay later, allowing people to stretch that eventually is going to come back to them? Uh, more confusion. A lot of confusion. Did you, did you get any clarity from earnings this week? Uh, no, I think a uh, challenging macroeconomic environment is still what I hear. Uh, from companies of transcripts and earnings calls that uh, that I listen to. Uh, generally speaking with the banks, I mentioned earlier that loan growth is very muted, flat to up one, down 1%. Uh, delinquencies that and charge-offs that are ticking up. Some banks want to call that normalization since they're still below the pre-pandemic level. Others are focused on the trajectory of that and that consumers... Are, are, are getting tapped out, uh, so to speak. Uh, and then on the manufacturing side, you know, you have Fastenal, which taps into and sells into that manufacturing sector, uh, still talking about, and, you know, they're subject to the manufacturing recession we're going on that's, that, that we're experiencing now globally. J.B. Hunt, which is transporting anything that's made, uh, they talked about the challenging freight environment, but gave some hopes that maybe uh, it will improve. Uh, so a lot of cross currents, not much visibility, and um, a, a very much a, a, a wait and see. I, I don't think that CEOs are, are really looking to predict too much of what this year is going to look like because uh, uh, the visibility is still somewhat cloudy. Yeah, I think it's a good point that predicting for the year in the past, you'd get a lot more talk, right? Here's what we think is going to happen this year. And, and maybe in 2024, it's a little bit like, well, let's just focus quarter by quarter. and We're going to focus on our business because I don't have a lot to say about what's happening in the broader world. So, you, you know, you mentioned earlier, you talked about China. Drill in a little bit on that for us, right? What's happening there? How does it really affect America? Because I keep hearing about the decoupling, right? Like what happens in China matters less to us right now. We had the Taiwan election. Does that really have a macro investing, you know, my dollars here in America, does that really have an impact to someone like me? It, it's, I mean, when you, the second biggest economy is always going to matter to the global economy. And it's going to matter to the U.S. in particular, as we buy about $500 billion worth of stuff from them every year. We only sell to them about $150 billion worth of stuff. So we have a huge, um, trade deficit with them. Explain so, how that works. I, I never fully understood like, what happens in the trade deficit because there's a money imbalance there, right? So how does that get evened out? Well, it gets evened out globally because some countries will have a surplus with, other countries will have a deficit with. Now, the US generally has a deficit with, with uh, most other countries, um, but there's nothing wrong with having a deficit. I mean, we benefit from buying cheaper stuff in China. But it means our money just keeps going out, right? Like we spend right. money outward and we get stuff. 
Right. But we, 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 we get that coming back to us, whether it's foreigners that are buying U.S. treasuries or uh, they travel to the U.S. or they buy our stuff. Uh, so, you know, Trump made the word deficit a, a four letter word, but it's not because we, we, we do have benefits from that. Like I said, you go into a Walmart and the average middle class family can afford to buy stuff. The lower income right. consumer can afford to buy stuff because we import stuff that's cheaper to make elsewhere than here. Yeah, we can onshore all this production, but you know, it'll it'll cost you uh, a lot more to buy stuff. It'll cost you, you know, twenty dollars to buy um, something that ordinarily would have cost ten. It'll cost you three thousand dollars to get your iPhone instead of thirteen hundred dollars. So there's there's benefits to globalization uh, in terms of of making it. More, I, I still believe in comparative advantage that we that we all learned in college and 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 econ one hundred and one. Uh, I think with the Chinese economy, you know, they took on so much debt that manifested itself in the residential real estate market and the local government uh, uh, side of the economy. And it takes years to unwind an, an, ex an excessive rise in debt. So the residential, but but the China acknowledges this. I mean, they, they, they wake up every day trying to delever their economy. Uh, and they've had a lot of success right now with distress and bankruptcies in residential real estate. Now, at some point, I don't know if it's going to be this year, but maybe next year, the housing market's going to bottom there, and as will their economy. Uh, the consumer side has been somewhat uneven. We had a big pickup in consumer spending when they reopened, but it's been bumpy since. But then you look at the Macau casino numbers and gross gaming revenue is, is about where it was in 2019. So that's recaptured its loss. China manufacturing, which is obviously a big piece of their economy, well, they're experiencing the same recession as the rest of us are because we've seen this uh, shift to spending on services and we've seen a lot of destocking going on uh, with respect to inventories. But at some point, we're going to see some evening out between spending on goods and services and we're going to see a restock that would benefit China manufacturing as it will uh, Europe and the U.S., uh, I, the level of bearishness on China is extraordinary. It seems like every day there's either bashing on China or another market sell-off. Uh, I actually think that the situation has gotten so dour in terms of sentiment that uh, I actually find the, Hanks, the Hang Seng Index uh, actually one of the most attractive markets in the world. And you have the potential, hopefully when the selling is done, uh, and that we've seen in January, that the Hang Seng can do uh, better than the S&P 500 this year. You mean, we're looking at this Hang Seng chart here. Woo. I mean, this thing has dropped 50% basically in two years. It's almost back to where it was when their economy was locked down. Yeah, it's, it's back to it's back to the levels like the bottom back in, uh, you know, 2009. It's back to the, the global financial crisis bottom levels. Yep, I, I agree. Uh, and and I'm, I'm actually, I'm bullish on Asia looking at it broadly. Uh, looking out you know, over the next 10 to 20 years, and a lot of companies in, that trade in Hong Kong do business throughout the region. So uh, it, you, uh, I do think that they're, the, the Hang Seng is trading at seven and a half times earnings. It's got a dividend yield of almost 5%. Uh, there's real value there for people that uh, have some uh, investing guts. No, I, I, think, I, I think you're right, right? I think like looking at that chart, it's pretty compelling there. Um, we talk about China, obviously the impact on the dollar, right? If, if rates are going to start poking up, are you strong? You, you know, you bullish the dollar right here or yeah, how do you play that? So I, I think it's important to look at the dollar in sort of two different buckets. You have the dollar index, which is very heavy, euro, yen, and pound. And to me, you have the dollar against a lot of other currencies. Uh, the Looking at the dollar versus the euro, yen, and pound, it, when you look at the action in the dollar last uh, three years when uh, policy started to change, monetary policy started to change. It really was just an interest rate differential thing. Uh, the dollar bottomed in June 2021 when Jay Powell at the Fed meeting said they're now thinking about tapering QE. The dollar took off. It topped out in October 2022, early November 2022, just as the Fed was slowing down their pace of rate increases from 75 basis points. So that's all the dollar did was just follow the aggressiveness and the backing off from the Fed. So here we are now with a little lift, with some tough Fed talk, but the dollar doesn't trade well against the Mexican peso, doesn't trade well against the Brazilian real, doesn't trade well against some other uh, Asian currencies, X and Yuan. 
So I think it's in, important to look at um, the dollar versus a different different baskets of currencies rather than it being used as the dollar up or down. And if the Fed does start to cut this year, uh, meeting maybe the bond market's expectations, I do think there's a lot of risk to uh, the dollar um, on the downside, particularly if they also slow down and start tapering QT. And then how does that impact commodities overall? What's your commodities stance here? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tie this into another trade-off here. Right. That starts to cut rates because they're they're comfortable with moderating inflation. But what hap- what if that leads to a notable drop in the dollar, which then leads to higher commodity prices like oil going back to 100, and all of a sudden we start importing inflation again? That is a potentially big trade-off that the Fed is going to have to deal with, and that also ending QT. And maybe that leads to weaker dollar, higher commodity prices, higher import prices, and inflection, higher inflation. And then the Fed is stuck again. I'm bullish on commodities. Uh, and we're long energy, we're long uranium, we're long copper, and uh, precious metals as a way to express that. Why do I keep hearing about uranium? Everyone's talking about uranium these days. What's going on here? So the price of uranium on a per pound basis a few years ago was in the 20s. And uh, as of yesterday, it was over 100. So you've had, ever since Fukushima, when uranium prices collapsed, uh, you've had this growing supply demand imbalance that each year, last couple of years, and certainly for the next uh, foreseeable future, uh, the world is going to be consuming more uranium than producing it. Plus, people are realizing that, that nuclear is the safest and most dependable form of energy. Uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, this runs in a clean fashion. And with um, what happened with Russia and Ukraine and Russia disrupting the world's energy supplies with the whole renewable craze, uh, nuclear is gaining a renaissance and a newfound appreciation. And uh, there's a lot of uh, nuclear plants that are being constructed around the world, particularly in emerging markets like China and India over the next uh, 10 to 20 years. And uh, there's just not enough uranium right now being produced uh, to meet this future demand. Now, at some point there will be, there's a lot of projects uh, that will come online in the next couple of years, but uh, right now it's uh, squeezing uranium prices higher. And if you're a utility that has a nuclear plant, the price of uranium is actually a small uh, percentage of your overall cost. So whether uranium prices are 50 or 100 or 200, you still need to buy uranium. So uh, there's still a lot of potential upside surprises to the price. And then lastly, before we go, what are we looking at? What are you focused on for next week? I think it's going to be all about earnings for the next couple of weeks. And uh, uh, particularly the, 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 the tech stocks that everyone loves again. It, it will be interesting to see how uh, they are managing this, this still uncertain economic landscape uh, globally, as a lot of these tech companies do have international businesses. I like it. Appreciate it, Peter. Thank you so much for the insight. It's going to be an interesting week, especially when we see the big earnings coming out. There's going to be a lot to talk about, a lot more information about where we are, certainly in seven more days. Uh, thanks so much for joining me here. My thanks to Peter Bookvar for coming on the show today. Thanks, of course, sir. you can check him out at the Bookvar Report, Bleakly Financial as well. And you can go to wealthion.com, get more information about the episode. If you like this one, please like it, share it, subscribe, do all of those fun things there. And if you go to wealthion.com, a lot more information. If you need to get in touch with a financial advisor, a wealth manager, somebody like Peter, for example, if you're trying to get some advice, a pro, you can go fill out a form there. We've got people we can connect you with. That's that's no obligation, of course, as always. So uh, thank you, Peter, for coming thank on the you. show today and appreciate the time. Good luck with the rest of your weekend. Thanks. You too. Great to be here.